This session is um, supposed to bring you up to speed with container technology. Um, we'll talk a lot about containers, but Docker in particular, and how, it, uh, how you will build your applications using Docker containers, Visual Studio 2017. Um, there will be a part on compositions because that will, that, that, that's an important part there. And we'll talk about container clusters, orchestrators, um, and how the the life cycle for developing applications will change. Who of you has, is, is currently using Docker in their solutions? Okay, so only a few people, right? Um, so I think that containers, and in this case, Docker is the current technology for it, that's the, the most popular, will change the way we build applications. And this session will take you through that. And I made this picture showing you um, how you will, will work with applications. Focus on the, um, the bottom part first, the inner loop. The inner loop is about how you will build applications, and we're on a .NET conference, so we'll talk ASP.NET Core in particular. How you will build your applications using Docker and Visual Studio, and do that in these small iterations, all running on your laptop. But as soon as you tested it, and it works fine, and you run on your unit tests, and um, you spun it up locally so your application is working as intended. You go into this outer loop where you will push what you build to your code repository. You will have these build pipelines and the build pipelines, they will start producing container images. And the container images capture everything about your application and they're there at a registry um, waiting to be consumed by your production environment. And the production environment to the right, that's where clusters will live, like these this meshes or fabrics of machines that work together to host your running containers. And containers, if you're not familiar with them yet, for now you can think of them as really tiny virtual machines, but they're not. So I will explain in a bit what they are and what the difference between virtual machines is. So, but just think of them, if you don't know anything about containers, think of them as virtual machines for now. Um, Running in production, you will get some feedback, maybe reported bugs, and you will continue in your inner loop again. So we'll look at the inner loop first. Um, instead of just doing all these slides explaining what containers are and what Docker is, I thought, why not just show it and, and, and see what it's like? And I remember the first time that I saw Docker being demonstrated and it just, it blew my mind and I had no idea what I was looking at. So I'll try to do my best to make it stick. And you can actually build containers where they put a pool inside. So I, I played water polo for plenty of years, so I would like to have a container with a pool in it. Anyway, um, let's see what we can do. Who of you is currently working with a, or building an application that needs some things installed on your device other than Visual Studio? like a database server, SQL server, maybe some cache mechanism. Is that everybody? Just go on, you can, don't be ashamed. I did it as well. I installed SQL server, took me a couple of hours. But what if you could do this? Use container technology. So just think of this container as isolated, running things. Oh, let me show this first, Docker images. So what I'm using is I installed Docker for Windows. Docker for Windows makes you, um, um, it's Docker tooling for, intended for Windows, and you can run containers, but they're containers that use Linux inside. So that's a thing of a twist. So Docker for Windows uses Linux. But if you have it installed, uh, you can use a command line interface, and it's Docker, and then you have commands. And I can do Docker images, and this will list all of these images that are there, and they're contained packages. And you can just spin them up, because inside there's, usually there's, a program there. Um, if, you, if you need new ones, you can find them in a registry. That's like, um, um, that like NuGet for .NET packages. You can pull them down and you can run them. 
Um, so in this case, we can do something like this. So I'm doing a Docker pool, and you see that the name says Microsoft SQL Server for Linux. Remember, Docker for Windows is Linux inside. And I already did it once, so the demo is a bit, but it will usually start downloading, extracting, and then it says it's done. And it's, it's actually, it was already there, so Docker images, you can see that the image is already there. Now all it takes for this to run is that I give it a, a long command, but the essence here is that I do docker run. I give it some, I accept the end user license agreement, I give it a password, and I will use the image name to say that's what I want to run. And if I start running this, it spins up this, this thing and it gives me a number. So in the background, there's now a SQL server starting up. Um, how can I tell? If I do a process view, it actually says that I'm running this um, Linux machine now. It's listening on port 2433 um, and it's spinning up. So we can see if we do Docker logs, I need to specify which logs do you want to see. And I have a running container. It has a name. If you don't specify a name, you get all these funky names that says Marvelous Miranda or something, like they, they make up names, but I said it should be um, the SQL Docker. And it has this unique ID, the one that we saw here, but this is the long one, this is the short one. So I can either type Docker log SQL Docker, and now it gives me all the logs that we didn't see, but it's spinning up in the background. I think it's good to go. So if you want to connect to it, I think we said it would be that one. And I just, this is, um, this is SQL Server Management Studio. Um, you can see that it's there. Because it's Linux, it doesn't use the, the colon, the two dots for the port number, but a comma. So it's, it's slightly different. But in here, we have an empty, fresh, and new SQL Server database. And it will be like this every time you start it. Because the image that we downloaded, it's fixed, you can't change it. You can run it, and once it's running, things can happen inside of the container, but if you kill the container and throw it away, the image, if you spin it up again, will give you a new, fresh SQL Server again. But this is all it takes, so pull it from the registry, start it up, and we have got SQL Server running. No installation, and with me doing less talking, it would be like one or two minutes, and you're running SQL Server. Um, okay. No. You could do something like this, create a database in it, so it just, it should populate this database. Create it, populate it, and now um, if it all went well, we have a thing here, and there's a database, there's tables in it, and we'll use this later on. So, um, what, what does this mean? So, if, if we have this uh, easy way to start up new uh, tooling, um, we can also run our con uh, application in containers. And with this, we can just prepare our environment to have a SQL server, but also have data. But uh, like, like I just said, if I kill this uh, SQL server, it will be empty again, and I need to make sure that the changes that I make are kept for a longer time. So how do we do that? So I will now do docker stop. Um, and remember we did the... Um, we use the name, but you can also use this, this, this number here if you want to be quicker about it. And you only need to type enough of the number so that it's unique. So in this case, um, 1db, the first three letters would be unique, but so would 1b. So I can do docker stop 1 or 1db, and it will actually stop the SQL server. And then to speed up, I will do a docker. So it's now gracefully, you can do docker kill, which just eliminates it immediately. And if I now do docker commit, then I would say something like uh, .next. And I need to do the container ID, I believe. Let me check. Um, yep, so 1db .next slash Microsoft what does SQL Server. SQL Server with some data. Um, let's call it live. Um, by doing this, I create a new image. 
And a new image is just a small increment on what we had with SQL Server. So we're adding what is called a new layer with only the delta. So it will be fairly small compared to the image for SQL Server itself because we only did create one database and put some data in it. That's the only difference, but it's a new image. So if we do Docker images, here's the, uh, the one that we just created. And I created one ahead of time. And I will now spin that up because we will be using it in a moment. So let me just avoid some typing here. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Like so. So we're spinning up another one that also has data in it. And we'll use that. Um, one other small thing. So this is a way to start tooling and how easy it is to, to start some tooling. Um, this is Portainer because I'm using all this, um, this command line things and if that's not your thing or you just want to be quicker about it, you can start up this Portainer which is another tool that you can pull and start. And if you use it, you will get this, uh, this dialog. You need to um, create a password quickly. And so, because it's, I started it many times, but every time you start it, it's clean again. And I would say I want to look at what I have running here. And I have the, this, this interface where I can also see which images do I have, uh, which containers are running. And it's just a point and click interface. But it, it, it uh, served from a, a web server. Um, but I didn't need to install anything because the container image is self contained, it contains everything you need to run. Okay. So what did we just see? We saw Docker technology. Did it make sense? Yeah, okay. So starting from virtual machines, as a reference. You have your infrastructure, you have your operating system, which could be anything that runs virtual, is able to virtualize your hardware, and you have some form of hypervisor, which is different whatever product you're using for that. And then you have a guest OS. So inside of your virtual machine, you will spin up a guest operating system and you will run your application there. And your application is intended to run on that particular operating system. And that's your virtual machine. Because it's all virtualized, you can do another one with another guest OS. So you can run a Linux distribution in there or another Linux distribution. You can spin up in virtual machines whatever you want. And they're isolated from one another. And if you switch to the container technology, there's a, a big, big, big difference there. Um, because here we have virtual machine images that include the guest operating system. So the, the images are usually fairly large and it contains all of your de um, dependencies, your binaries for the application. But if you go to containers, and I'll start with Linux containers first, you still have your infrastructure, so your actual hardware or maybe virtualized hardware. But So if you're running in Azure, everything is virtualized, but you can still think of it as actual machines. You have, for Linux, a Linux-based host operating system. So you must run Linux to be able to run containers with Linux. Because the kernel is inside of the operating system and the applications, they just use the kernel underneath. So there's no guest OS there. They just are using the kernel, but they're isolated. They're isolated from one another. So there's this wrapper around it and nothing can go outside and nothing can come inside out of the container and the container technology is part of the operating system. It's been in there for, for a long time, since the beginning of Linux, since the beginning of Windows, but it, it wasn't used as much. And now they've discovered the power of the isolation that you can provide and the lightweightness. You saw all the images that I started as containers to spin up like in a fraction of a second. That's how fast they start. Start up a virtual machine and you have to wait for the operating system to boot. So that's a totally different world. But they're started from images, immutable images, so they, they can't be changed. But inside of the container, your application lives. It can write files, it can access the network, um, so that can be done. But if you're doing containers, all your applications must be running the same, uh, built for the same operating system, the host operating system. So you can't run a Windows container on a Linux machine. You can't run a Linux container on a Windows machine unless you're doing tricks like Docker for Windows. Um, okay, so no guest OS needed, so the images are usually fairly small. Windows containers have a, an, another thing, so they, you will be using Windows Server 2016, you will run your apps there, and there will be Windows Server containers. You will find that 
these are there on Windows Server only. Um, so it's, it's the same as we just saw, except it's now Windows and Windows. It can't never be, uh, always must be the same. But what Windows also has, it has its own hypervisor for virtualization, but they build on top of the hypervisor this Windows operating system. So it is a guest operating system. It's running inside of a virtual machine, but it's a specialized virtual machine. And the Windows that is running in there is also optimized to run as a container host instead of a virtual machine host. And this is called a Hyper-V Windows container. Um, it gives you better isolation because the virtualization does more than the container isolation. So in, in some situations this might be beneficial. What is coming soon is that Microsoft is building this new uh, Linux operating system um, that is also optimized for Hyper-V containers. So you can actually run also Hyper-V Linux containers on your machine. So this makes it possible to develop your applications Parts of them running on Linux, parts of them running on uh, Windows, and some of them just straight on for, for improved performance or whatever, uh, straight on to the operating system as a Windows Server container. Now, why is this important? Who is still running ASP.NET for something? Yeah, okay, we're not all doing ASP.NET Core yet, right? So, if you want to run those, it only runs on Windows. So, all the good stories about ASP.NET Core can run cross-platform, they're good, so you have freedom of choice. But for ASP.NET and your legacy, legacy applications, means that you still need to run on Windows. Um, and this Windows as an operating system offers you the best of both worlds. So keep that in mind if you need to transition from the old world to the new world, old world being the full framework versus .NET Core as the new one cross-platform, you can actually start transitioning in this way. It's coming soon, so it's not there yet. And then you have the Docker engine that's capable of um, um, steering all of it um, and it ties that back to Docker, where we just saw that we have a CLI, a command line interface. You give it all these commands, and you work with your images, you work with the running containers, um, and you will do network stuff to do to flash them together if there's multiple containers, but they do need to speak to each other. Um, and it's all done by uh, this REST API that talks to the daemon, which is this piece of software that just coordinates all the containers and images running on a single host. Okay, I, I, I built this application that is about um, uh, gaming, because I like gaming, uh, I like old video games, um, and I thought that this, this would be a, an application that can keep high scores. If you have an application, um, preferably um, JavaScript, but it could be anything that's capable of calling a web API, you could have a leaderboard web API, um, that keeps track of high, uh, scores that come in, and there's this MVC application that is able to consume the API, find out what are the highest scores for each of the games, and then show it in a page with a high score table. I won't show everything here, so we will focus on this. We'll focus on the web application, the web API with its database, and we can call the web API, and you can see the page um, that shows all the high scores. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so here's my application. I'll try to zoom in as much as possible for the people in the back. The application has uh, two parts that I need to take care of. Because you saw the database, we'll do the trick we did in the beginning. We'll spin up a container with, with SQL Server. We already did that. Um, then there's my MVC application, and there's the web API. Now let me just start the web API. And I'll do a debug, start new instance. And when I do this, this is without containers. So we'll just do the old, the old way. So it's starting up. Notice how it's running on this port 41337. So it's probably what you saw if you did some hosting in IIS. IIS has started here in the bottom. Let me see if I can find it. It doesn't show it. Um, so here in the bottom, there's IIS, and it started my application. Um, it's running the leaderboard API, and it, there's nothing there yet. But if we just clean this, I added some swagger, and it will give you the swagger, and we can add some scores from the UI. And we can say, okay, so this is one of the players in there, and we'll, which game do we do? Someone? Game? 
Tetris. Oh, good. Classic. Um, I'm not sure what the, the actual scores are, if this is an outrageous score or just a normal score. Uh, I get a response 200. I can go to the leaderboard and I could say, show me what you've got. And there's actually some JSON returning um, with the high score that we just added. So this goes into the database. Where did the database live? It was the one that I said I would start up ahead of time because we would be using it. That's the one we're connecting to now. Okay, quickly go through some small things. Here's um, um, the object model. Let me clear some things here. So there's scores, there's a gamer. I do this foreign key so I can do entity framework. I have a leaderboard context. So if you ever did an um, entity framework, it's here, otherwise go check out uh, Thomas's talk. I believe tomorrow he's doing a talk on Entity Framework. Is it ready yet? Go check that out, he'll talk a lot about Entity Framework. Um, and there's two uh, DB sets there for gamers and for scores. I have uh, some seeding, so I, if the database spins up and um, I'm sure that it's, the database exists and there's no gamers yet, I will add some gamers, otherwise I say, okay, I'm done. So you can pre-populate, or you can do it with the seeding. Um, that, uh, let's see, in the startup, there's a couple of interesting points there. So um, one of the interesting one is, um, so here's the swagger sport, but this is an interesting one, the connection string. The connection string is taken from this leaderboard context. Anybody know where this is coming from in your ASP.NET Core application? Web config file, yep, and the new one is called app settings JSON. So it's, it's, it's the new or the equivalent one. Um, so you have this specialized section here, if you name it connection strings, you can have multiple entries here, and from, the, um, from your code you can just say get connection string, and then read it like that. I'll, I'll come back to reading um, configuration later on. And that we will use for, um, for our uh, SQL server. And you can see that it's uh, the one we just spun up and it's doing a local host connection here. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Then we have the other one, that's the front end. Let's start the front end as well. And while it's spinning up. So this should be able to communicate with the, uh, the web API. It will get the high score for Tetris that we just, that we just did. Um, it's a bit smallish, but here we have the front end and it just did a retrieve of a call to the web API and it gives me the high score for Tetris. Okay. Um, notice how um, also how it says running on Microsoft Windows 10. This is a Windows 10 Pro edition. It supports hypervisor, so you can do all the Hyper-V um, hyper stuff. Um, it's now running on Windows, so no containers yet. Um, I won't go into too much details on this uh, controller, but it's fairly simple. It uh, has this proxy um, that I need to call to the web API. It has uh, the async implementation and a little bit of uh, proxy here that just says, okay, we need some endpoint. This is uh, the relative endpoint and we need a full endpoint. That's the host URI, but we need to get it from somewhere as well. And it may change from your machine to running in production. Um, this is some code, uh, the source code, I'll make that available so you can have a look at what it does, but it's just an HTTP call out to the other side. Okay. Um, now let's quit all this. What you can do in Visual Studio 2017 is you can add projects to your solution, and when you do, um, and you pick one, you can actually add Docker support. So you just tick the box and you get Docker support. If you don't do it, it's, it's okay, you can do it afterwards. And I did it ahead of time, but afterwards you can do add then Docker support, which is here. Now it's gray because it's already there. Um, and we can add the Docker support, which means that a couple of things happen. First of all, there's this Docker file that's being added. Um, and Microsoft uh, built all this uh, IntelliSense stuff, so I can say I'm the maintainer here. Um, like this, and this will um, specify a file, and this Docker file is used to indicate how images are built. Um, so we'll go through the loop of what hap what's happening there uh, in a second. Um, another thing that's uh, being done by, um, if you, is that you get this Docker Compose project. 
and you will get one for each solution. And every time you add a project, new stuff is added in all of these YAML files. And we'll talk about the YAML files in a bit as well. Um, the Docker Compose is your startup project. So um, you can see that here, that there's this option to start either of the projects, but also the Docker Compose project. And that takes care of everything that we just saw, the web API, the MVC application, all, all together. And that is what is our next thing. So let's go back. I'll do a build. And if you do a build with the Docker Compose in there, all of a sudden your build will have all this other stuff in there, like Docker Compose, and it's doing things, and there's more happening than just building your uh, assemblies in the projects. That's happening as well, so they build all the assemblies, but then they just do this Compose thing and, and start all of that. Now notice how we had, um, if we go here, we do another Docker images. Um, just memorize this list. There's no things that start with my name, right? Um, and I will do the following. I will do a F5 to start a project. The Docker composes the starter project, and it will do compiling, checking this composition, and start everything up, but also create new images. So if this is spinning up, you can see here, if I could just quickly quit this, you can see these things, and you might recognize some of the commands that we just saw in the Docker file. But this will spin up, and we'll go to slides first now. Um, well, maybe, let me see. Okay, I think it's good to go when we, if we do another Docker images. Um, yeah, uh, there it is. These two are new. So I have these development images that contain either the, the containers images for each of my projects. Okay, so what happened there? Let's, let's have a look. Um, Visual Studio 2017 has, has this good Docker support. It's all the official tooling that they support. It's not their own version that Microsoft built. Uh, we talked about enabling Docker support from the start. You can do advanced debugging straight into your container. We'll look at that in a bit. And you can add, this. so this is what you saw in the demo. There's also an additional item hidden under the Docker file, the Docker ignore file, which is used by Docker. Um, and then you have this Docker file per project. So each of your projects that needs to be turned into a container image will have this Docker file. And it's a set of instructions that tell you how to build a Docker image layer onto layer. So it's, it, you start with this base image. It says from Microsoft ASP.NET Core 1.1. That's your starting point. You say, OK, I, I need to start with this base image, and then I'll start adding stuff my application. And that, that's important to know. So let's, let's see what's happening uh, at that point. So you start with your base image. That's all the way down. Where are you running on top of? Windows or Linux? And which Linux? So you could do Microsoft Windows Nano Server, which is very, very small. You could do Windows Server Core or just the full-fledged Windows. Or you could do one of the Linux distributions like Debian Jesse. Let, let's pick that one. Um, first of all, in order to run your ASP.NET applications, you need .NET Core. So you will add the runtime dependencies, the things that are not in the operating system but that are needed, like SSH or SSL support that's added to it in case of uh, running on, a, um, on the, some of the Linux distributions. Then you have the .NET Core runtime that's being added. You have the SDK if you need that. And then it adds the additional binaries for ASP.NET Core. And then finally, this is where we started. That, that was, was in the, uh, the Docker file from ASP.NET Core with a particular version. And then you say, OK, and on top of it, I want to build my application. And that's what we just did. But it's all these small increments. Um, okay, there's, there's all these, um, this, this um, convention in naming your containers and tagging them because the, the colon that you see that's, that's here, let me see if I can highlight that. So the colon here, this is actually the, the registry, so where it's located. This is the registry that is owned by Microsoft. This is the image name and then there's the version number there. And the version numbers, they, they can, uh, there, there's uh, some consistency there. So latest is always the latest. If you have um, version one, it means the highest one underneath. If you do a one zero, that's the um, long-term support version. And you can read about it there. And if you want, if you started with the nano server image, you uh, will see that the tag names have all this dash nano server behind it because it's different images 
the layering is might be similar, but it's it's starting from something else, Linux or Windows, and then you add on top of it. Once you have these images, they are pushed into a store or a registry. You have the official Docker store where you can find uh, Oracle server images. Um, you can uh, find Redis for caching or uh, Nginx for proxying. Um, or you can have your own registries. And what we just saw a second ago is how this image is built. So your sources are compiled, that's the first step, and it produces the regular output. So it's either b debug binaries or release binaries. But it also builds this, this thing, this, this Docker folder, and it's a, it's a sort of a workaround. And it has to do with the fact, so this is um, going to change probably because they it will be fixed, but if you see in debug, there's this Netcore app 1.1, that's the framework you're targeting. Microsoft had some issues finding out which framework you're targeting from the csproj file. So the, the project file, they couldn't read where you would target, so they said, okay, let's put it in the Docker folder and we'll work from there. Because you need the assemblies and sometimes other files as well to be put into your container image if you're making your image, if you're creating it. How you create it is at the bottom, so you have this, this working directory, you say, okay, slash app, that's where I want to work, that's where I'll put my application. And you then do your copy, so you copy everything over from either the empty folder or the published folder. And we'll talk about the difference when we talk about debugging. Um, and then finally there's this entry point, which says this is what you need to run. If the image starts, your entry point is what is being executed, so you see .NET, and then leaderboard web API DLL. So you just spin up your assembly and you start self-hosting your application. In this case, the web API. Um, so it gets copied down into the image, the image is created and finalized and it ends up in your list on your local machine. Some magic, I said it was a workaround, so there's this, this thing, this Docker build source, that it's, it's done by Visual Studio, you can't get at it, but it, it, it's there, and they do this other trick. If Visual Studio is building it, it will actually use the front part, so the source. It's an argument that Visual Studio sets, are we doing debug or release? Um, if you're not doing all of this tooling from Visual Studio, which you can, then um, it will not be set. So it needs something else, and it falls back to the object Docker publish. Remember this, object Docker publish is where it copies stuff from. And then you have this, this history where you see each of the lines inside of your Docker file being layers in your new image that you're creating. And you're throwing away everything except the final layer and you say, okay, that's what I want to keep, including the rest, but it's just a new image that is on your system. Um, Docker ignore tells you what to copy and what to ignore, so it ignores everything except the publish and the empty folder. And, and then from there on, we can start running your, um, your containers and your applications. Um, so let's see. Um, let's do a bit of running. Let me see if this works better now. So if you press F5, it will actually start running your, uh, your application. So this is from the debug output, and it's loading everything. So, but this is all happening inside of containers, and your containers are going into your uh, machine. So this is the website. It's running at a different port now. So you can see it's 8080. It doesn't have the, the high score list yet. Uh, it might be because there's nothing there, um, but also it can be that the um, the web API is slower in spinning up, so it tries to contact it, doesn't get a reply, and just says, okay, I can't reach it, and it doesn't uh, um, give an exception, but just gracefully says, oh, there's nothing there. Um, if we go to the other one, I believe it's this one. Let me check. Yep, that's the, um, so that's the uh, URL, a different URL, as you can see, so no longer the 40,000 something numbers, because this is now running from inside of a container. Um, Let's go back to some slides. So that's how easy it is to run containers. Oh, just, I forgot to show you. So if we go back to the home page, let's go back there. Uh, 
3080. Notice how it now says running on Linux and some version number. So just because we're hosting it from a uh, container now, the container is running Linux. You can see that we're actually running Linux all of a sudden. And it's because of .NET Core. ASP.NET Core can just be multi-platform. So if we just add the proper runtime, Windows or Linux runtime, we can run it either Windows or on Linux. Um, and you saw the difference. I changed none of the code. I just changed my running environment. Um, the, which also means that the application settings JSON, it said that we would be running from this local SQL server. Uh, it might not be a local SQL server or a different connection string. Um, how does debugging work? Because we were able to debug. Um, let me see, let me see. I had a break point. And if I refresh this now, then all of a sudden we hit break points. Um, we're there, we can um, work with um, our application running inside of a container, and it's transparent that you're running, going from Windows to Linux and doing debugging there. Uh, so cross-platform debugging, in action, um, you can do all the things you know about debugging. And the other cool thing that you can do, let me just quickly try and find something. So if we were to change something in one of the files, so make the logo a little bit smaller, which is just not a really uh, big thing to do. Um, and then F5, continue, and it hits the web API breakpoint. So this is just a, a link query for link to entities you will see that the logo is now a tiny bit smaller. So you can actually change things on the fly and you don't have to bake the image um, uh, from uh, all over again and restart everything. You can just do like this live changing inside of your container, um, but it was immutable, right? You couldn't change anything inside. So how can this be? be? How can that be? If we run the container, uh, we spin up this .NET driver with the, uh, the assembly, and what Visual Studio does, it, it adds the extra thing. So it doesn't copy over the assembly in the case of um, um, if you run in debug mode, but it has all these volume mappings at the bottom. So it maps your local file system. So my files or my C drive, it maps it into the container to particular locations. So it does it for the source files, it does it for the NuGet packages, and it does it for the cross-platform debugger, CLRDBG. Then it hooks up the debugger, and it's CLRDBG for Linux, and it's MSVS Mon for if you're uh, debugging Windows-based ASP.NET applications, and you can do the debugging session. Um, it maps into your um, um, user profile folder, so that's where you can actually find all these .NUGET slash packages or CLRDBG, you can find them there. Um, and then another important things to, uh, thing to remember. You're building a debug or release configuration, and your container is self-contained. But for debug builds, they do this trick where they map your source files and they map everything on your host file system, your C drive. So that's the dev, the dev uh, images are there. But um, because they copy this empty folder, there's nothing in your container unless you do the volume mapping. So if you ever start playing with this and you do run your application from the command line, do docker run and start your image. If you do the dev images, you will get this message that says, Command not recognized, please install a .NET SDK because it thinks you're actually with the .NET assembly name, you're, you're calling a command from the SDK and it, they can't find it. But it's an indication that your files, your assemblies are not there, which is true because it's an empty folder. It, there's nothing there unless you run from Visual Studio. So you need to build release images that contain your assemblies and all your files that go with it, your runtime files. Um, yeah, and the difference between ASP.NET Core and uh, the, the original full framework one. So we talked a bit about debugging. Well, let me check how we're doing. Also doing in time. Okay, we're good. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's one nice thing to do. So clear the screen and I'll do Docker PS. So it, it is a bit messy because I increased the font for the people in the back. Um, so it wraps the lines, but you can actually see that there's this, um, this, this gaming web app, that's the MVC application, the web API, and then we have the SQL Server Linux. All three of them are spun up when I pressed F5. So let's just briefly step into this one, because it's a container, it's running there, 
But I can do docker exec, I can execute something inside of a container, I'll take a bit of those numbers, so I'll take uh, BDE, um, and I'll do an exec minus interactive, um, and a terminal, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll execute a bash command. So bash is like the command prompt in Visual Studio. And you can see now that I'm at root, and I have this hash, I'm inside of the Linux container running a Linux operating system. And I'm not much for uh, Linux, I, I never grew up with it, but I know that I can do ls, and ls is like a dir or directory, and you can see that's the source files there. They're on my file system. If I change it on the C drive, it gets reflected here because these are the same files. So that's how we could do the index HTML, how we could change it. Um, it's, it's because of this. They just do the volume mapping. If you go back a bit and you look at the root folder, there's this CLRDBG here, which contains the debugger. Um, uh, DBG. And then you can see there's all these SO files, so DLL files for Linux, that contain the cross-platform debugger. Um, so you can interact with it and you can troubleshoot it because you can just step inside of your container and see what's happening there. Okay. Now, you can start all of these images by yourself by doing docker run like we did with the SQL Server, but you notice how easy it was that I could just press F5 and it spun up all three containers, the MVC app, the API, and the SQL Server. Um, it's because of composition. And it's a, a, another tool in the Docker suite, it's called Docker Compose, and it helps you automate everything that you want to do with um, your containers, your images, your containers, building them, running them, deploying them. It's magic, it's, it's really cool that you can do all of this because it's just a single command, Docker Compose, and you give it commands and it does stuff for you. And it uses these YAML files that we saw inside of the Docker Compose project in Visual Studio to describe what your composition, what it, what it looks like. Um, so you have services, you describe services, leaderboard, web API, and you tell it, okay, it uses the image leaderboard.web API. And it depends on SQL.data. And SQL data is described at the bottom. It says it's the image Microsoft SQL Server Linux, the one that we also used. And in the middle, there's the gaming web app, which consumes the web API. So it depends on the web API, and it has its own image. And you see the little build blocks. It also contains uh, instructions on how to build it. And it, it does it by just pointing to the Docker file for each of the projects. But it's a complete description of your application. If you tell Docker Compose, okay, start running this. It knows what to do with the dependencies, the order. It might have some race conditions still, but in general, you can just spin everything up or build everything inside of your Docker Compose. Um, in general, it has, a, it has more in it, so you can do um, environment variables, which are very important, port mappings, networks, and volume mappings. So you can all put that inside of your Docker Compose file as well. Um, Visual Studio uses 2.1 at, uh, at the moment, but it will change to 3.0, 3.1 also fairly soon. You can use it, but you can't do it with the Visual Studio tooling. And we'll start with a bit of a, a weird uh, um, container description. It's in your, um, in your project if you add a Docker support, and it's this Docker Compose CI build, so continuous integration build YAML file. And what it does, it has this special container that's ASP.NET Core build. And that's a container that has everything inside to build .NET Core applications, ASP.NET Core in particular. And at the command level, it says do a .NET restore, .NET publish, and then do a uh, release at the Docker publish location that we saw before. Um, so let, let's do that and see what happens there. So I'll exit from, um, from Linux. We're back in, um, in Windows again. And then I can do, let me try and type it by hand by once. So um, in, in, we're in the folder here that has all the Docker Compose files. You can see them there. This is the root of your solution. Um, so you can do Docker Compose. Which file should it use? It should use the Docker CI build YAML. And we want to do an up, which means spin it up. And what it will do is we'll start the image. It will get to the sources, and it will start attaching to the, um, to the image. And it will, if we have a connection and all, it will start restoring packages. So 
what you do in Visual Studio is now happening inside of a container. This you can do on a machine that doesn't have Visual Studio installed, just like the SQL Server. You can do this on a build server that's not a Microsoft build server. But if it's capable of running Docker containers, you can use this to just build your complete application. Now let me see if we stopped this. I'll stop it here. And I'll, I'll try to, because we're now building this, um, so that's compiling all of, the, um, all of the assemblies. That doesn't build images yet. But I can use the build command to also build the images. So this is compiling. Um, and I should say that we now use the CI build YAML file. Um, and while this is running, let me show you the other one. It's this one. This is the one that I showed you with all the arrows going to the, um, to the application. But you can see that it, in the build section it says, okay, this is your context, so the source folder, and you'll find a Docker file there, just do that. That's the build. So if we do a uh, Docker compose, but instead of doing the file, um, let me see, this YAML file instead, instead of the CI build, and I do a build command, Oh, that might not, okay, just once more, like this. It will now take all the OBJ Docker publish stuff and start building the containers. And you see the, um, the files there, this is the maintainer that I added, so it also has that. And it started building these things, um, and it actually built this completer versions with latest. So Docker images, and you see that we have now new images here that are release builds, because the CI build had this dash C release for a release build. And it doesn't have the dev tag, that's debug builds, this is the release build. Okay, so quickly, because we're running out of time, um, there's more there, because it, besides the Docker Compose YAML, there's other files underneath. And there's this possible layering that you can have, uh, other layering, a hierarchy that you can create. You start with the Docker Compose, it describes your services, your images, how to build them, the networks, the dependencies between them. Um, but on top of it, you would want to add some environment variables because we started with uh, running it without containers, then we started with containers, but we might be shifting back and forth between running on my laptop, running in the cloud, um, so you need different port mappings, different environment variables, because your connection strings, your IP addresses, things change from environment to environment. And Visual Studio has this debug thing or a release YAML file where it does the volume mapping, the debuggers, and that's also added. And the order is important, so you do Docker Compose dash F for each of the files, and the last one determines the outcome. So you can define connection strings multiple times, but the last one wins. Let me just show you quickly what is in there. So inside of this uh, VS debug, you can see that there's this environment variable, there's the volume mappings and a different entry point that just keeps the container running so we can attach to it and see things happening there. Um, and it's only the two that we are using. So SQL Server is not here because it just needs to run like it does. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and do this once. Um, so I can do with dash f uh, docker, and I need the override, like this, and I'll do an up. So what I'm now saying is use the file, port already allocated, yep. So let's see. Docker ps, there's all these things running. I'll do nasty stuff now, uh, docker kill, and just list out all of the services um, we kill all of them no. no response okay let's see if this continues to work yep and do this one again and hopefully it's a bit better now yep there we go so it's creating this network uh, it's creating the database uh, so it's actually doing what Visual Studio is also doing, but now we're running it from the command line, and you can see it spin up here. This would be happening in your cluster as well. If you put this in a cluster, this is how you spin it up. So it, it's, it's actually crashing now because the database wasn't up while the web API tried to run, um, get to it, but that's okay. So database spinning up, and there's a race condition there. 
but I'll just stop it and it, it will stop everything. Let's move on. Okay, so important thing here is if you build your container, it has configuration in it. That's the web config or the, for ASP.NET applications. It's the uh, app settings JSON for .NET Core applications. Whatever you have, it's put inside of the image and it's fixed. You can never change it. And it's something that's read from the file. The file is there with your deployment. So how, if you use that, would you change it? Because if you run this on your local machine, it's different connection strings or IP addresses from another environment. Container images can't be changed. That's the good thing about them. You have them, you can ship them from environment to environment, but your environment does change. So we need to take that into account. And that's the, this will affect you as a .NET developer. This is what you need to know and get your head around, that you must read um, environment variables from your environment to know where you are running and how. So all the things that vary from environment, from one environment to the other, you cannot read just as uh, hard-coded values. You must do something about it. So that's, that's the next step. How would you read the red stuff outside of the container and use that inside of your application while it's starting up? Maybe you've seen this. This is the, uh, the startup file of an ASP.NET Core application. It says, okay, I have this configuration builder, start adding JSON files. That's the app setting JSON or overrides that you can have of that with your environment name in it. Um, this is where you have your app settings and the development or JSON, uh, sorry, the uh, production version as well. Um, but you can also add environment variables. And it's, uh, maybe you thought of this as, yeah, that's just the, the set um, from, from a DOS command prompt, like a, um, a those environment variables. But it's also the environment variables, and I hope that it is viewable, where if you do docker run, you can actually pass in environment variables as well. So they can be coming from multiple places, and the good news is that add environment variables just pushes it into the, uh, um, the configuration, and it will just magically appear when you ask for a connection string, but then it's coming from an environment variable, or from your docker compose file, because it does the same key value pairs inside of the compose file, which overrides the things that may have been set from the environment itself. Um, I won't go into this for the sake of time, but you can just read the configuration, but the configuration will take care of it. You need to know that you need to add, add environment variables, or add Azure Key Vault, if you want to read from Key Vault, or add Docker Secrets to read Docker Secrets, which is also possible. Um, there's funky stuff that you can do in um, getting the, um, um, the configuration into this, this object that you build yourself, like this web app settings. You can just deserialize them into there and then pass that along with dependency injection if you wanted to. Um, and then we're moving to container clusters, which is not trivial. This is a Docker Swarm cluster. Um, this is well, something that you will get if you spin it up in SQL, sorry, in Azure if that's your uh, cloud provider. You can do it in uh, Amazon or you can um, do it in Google Cloud as well. But it, there's these manager nodes, there's these worker nodes, um, they're all working together, they have load balancers, they communicate, coordinate. There's a lot of things to be taken care of, um, which is sometimes called a fabric or a cluster, but the orchestrator needs to manage all of those things. You ask me to run something on a cluster, where shall I put it? Which one is the least busy? Um, how much do I still have? What are the constraints? I need to run on a Windows machine. So put me on somewhere in the cluster that runs Windows. All of those things can be taken care of with a variety of orchestrators. Pick your poison, so you can do service fabric. Uh, the Kubernetes is from Google. Uh, you have Mesos DCOS from Mesosphere or Docker Swarm. And I'll, I'll zoom into Docker Swarm because I think that's a really cool one. Um, but as a container service, as an offering from Azure, just gives you the choice, which one do you want to have? So Service Fabric is one. Azure Container Service will let you pick uh, Kubernetes, Swarm, or DCOS. And there will be something coming that is called Swarm Mode. Remember that, what I'm showing you is Swarm Mode, not Docker Swarm. That's the old technology from Docker. Docker Swarm Mode is the new one. And then we go into our outer loop because we've, we've done the inner loop, we've done all the running it locally, we build the images, but they're on my machine only now, and now I need to push them out through a source uh, control uh, or source code repository, and then through some build pipelines. So, focusing on this, 
you will find that there's all these registries available. There's the official ones from Docker and Microsoft. Um, this is the one, a screenshot from my Docker registry that I claimed. Um, I use my name for it, but you can use your company's name or your own private name, and it's your repository. Um, and you can put all this stuff there. There's Azure Container Registry, and there's the Docker Store, which is the official version of Docker Hub, where you will also sometimes need to pay to pull images from, uh, from the Docker uh, Store. Um, so the final thing we need to do is, if we have this, um, uh, this cluster running, we need to pick up our images that we built locally or from our build server, push them into the cluster. And you can do it directly or you can do it through a container registry. And I'll, I'll try and show that um, as the final part of this presentation. So let's see how you can deploy all the stuff that we build into a cluster. So what I have is in Azure, and it's not important, I can show you this afterwards, but it's, this is all the resources in my resource group that build the cluster. There's virtual machines there, and there's all these load balancers, public IP addresses, everything that we saw in the big diagram. Um, that, that's where I'm talking to. Um, what I did here is I have this um, git posh. It knows SSH. So I ran this complex command, SSH. I'm creating a tunnel into the cluster. I'm connecting to port 50,000, which is the manager node, and I can talk to the cluster afterwards. But I need to tell it that I need to use a specific port. So let me just grab some commands for the sake of time. So I'll take this one. So I do a uh, Docker. It says connect through localhost 2374. That's the port that I claim. But, but if I talk to that, I actually talk to Azure into the cluster. And it says, OK, I've got these three nodes, a manager and two worker nodes. They're ready, and they're good to go. Um, what do we have there? Well, if I deploy something, Docker Swarm has this notion of a stack, which is the composition of your application. So if I do uh, Docker stack ls, I actually have one deployed, dot .next, and it's um, running three services, the web API, the MVC application, and the SQL Server database. Um, what else can we do? We can see in that particular thing which processes are running. And it has a couple of running, and you see that one of them failed, this one. So this one failed at first. That's the race condition. SQL Server was not fast enough to spin up, so it crashed. But the cluster took care of it by just trying again and trying again until it finds that it's healthy. So this is running in the cloud. And to show you that, um, so if we go to this public IP address on a port, um, you can see the same things running in the cloud now. It has a different configuration, obviously, because things have changed. And how did I describe that? I used um, this other Docker Compose file. It uses version 3, because otherwise you can't do Docker stack commands. But it says, OK, I have this image in a repository somewhere. Where is that repository? It's here. This is my repository. So here's the gaming web app, and I upload my images there by pushing them there. Um, and then I can tell the cluster, just start running this um, and use this image. So we'll pull down the image from the registry and like I did it on my machine, but then inside of the cluster and spin that up. Um, it has different port numbers. It has a different connection string. Um, and so I tweak this to be um, um, tuned for deploying a cluster. You would want to keep them the same, but this is version three. On my uh, Visual Studio, I need two point something, so I can't combine them. But normally, you would just do the layering and the, the, the multiple compose files to make distinctions between local machine and your uh, production environment. With this, uh, final thing to show, I think, is that I can do um, a deploy. And now I need to make sure that I call it .next live. And it will just start creating network services, and it will start pushing those things out. And this is now spinning up um, the other stuff. So this, this is still booting. You can see the services as well. Um, let me see. 
Um, and you can see that there's uh, all these replicas, just one of each. But if you wanted to uh, increase that and do scaling, you can do something like this. So I will say scale the service that's called .next live. I'll do the, this one. And if I quickly go to this one, you can see that it's already spinning up multiple things. It's now running two, and probably it's now running three. So I just increased the number of containers running for my, uh, my MVC front end to run in three separate ones. And with the load balancer, it's distributed. So I just increased the capacity for my application. Okay, that, that was enough yes for me, but I'll respect your time as much as possible. So let's just go to um, VSTS, so Visual Studio Team Services. I created a build here, um, and what I do in this build, um, if I just um, edit it, I define these build steps inside of my uh, pipeline that use Docker Compose to compile, and I'll, I'll use the files, the CI build, um, to say, okay, this is how you build the um, um, the images, uh, sorry, the, the the binaries, how you build the uh, the images, and then finally how you push them out into the registry. So this is the building pipeline. It pushes everything into the registry, and then you could do a release pipeline where you could release each of the container images into your cluster by just saying, okay, update this service. This is the new image. So um, you can do it, not everything in one go, which is possible, but also very granular, because this is very close to a microservice-based architecture. So you can just upgrade one service and leave the rest in place. So, finishing up, what we saw all in all is the inner loop, where you do all this stuff on your local machine. We saw how Docker Compose makes it easier to orchestrate and coordinate all the things around containers. How you would, if I would do a git commit, then I would end up in VSTS the repository. I could trigger the build pipeline. It will push everything inside of the registry. And then my cluster, I can use commands or a user interface if I have it um, to say, um, to tell the cluster, get new images for these services and just evolve your application while it's running. And it can do rolling upgrades uh, to not be out of some um, working order. This is your new world, I think. Um, yeah, thanks. We'll leave it at that, and thank you very much.